everybody. I'm so excited to have with me today on my Zero Carb Life, Mary Roberts, who some of you know as Keto Mary 71. And Mary, I was just reading through your story and listening to you on Judy Cho, which I love her. Is she not delightful? Yeah, she's so awesome. She is. And you were wonderful on there with her. But Thank we you. have a lot in common, my friend. We All right. Do. We do. So we both help admin for kind of large keto carnivore Facebook groups. Yes. <laughs> um, I was just taking some notes here on things that I was like, oh, I feel you on this. We both have three children. Mm -hmm. We both, our highest weight was 262. Ooh, or awesome. 260. 260. 260 you know, 260. Yeah. We <clears throat> were both in our 40s. We both lost over 100 pounds. So high five right there. Virtual high Yay. five. <laughs> um, and now we're both strict carnivore. And something I didn't know is we were both in Women's World Magazine, which I'm going to take this moment to talk about what a not fun experience that was. No offense, Women's World. Okay, yeah. A little bit of offense, Women's World. Yes. A little bit of offense. And, and I'll probably use the actual picture. The picture that they, whatever they did to the picture, that is supposedly me. My children were like, who is that? <laughs> that was supposed to be me. <laughs> they got it so wrong. They had the daily eating plan for a carnivore diet, including avocados. I was so, I had already told everybody, zero carb is going to be in women's world. Yeah. It wasn't. So all of that to say, I love your story. And I, I did a lot with so many steps of it. And now I promise I'm going to hush. Tell us, how did you get here, Mary? So, I mean, I had a lifelong dysfunctional relationship with food, like as from a preteen, you know, all the way till when I discovered keto at age 42, I was, you know, I'd been through hospitalization for bulimia. I'd been in and out of, you know, like trying different therapists and I did OA and of course every diet known to man, right? Like Richard Simmons, deal a meal, Weight Watchers, Slim Fast and everything in between, Fentramine, all that stuff. I struggled my entire life. Yeah. Um, and I finally realized at age 42 when I found myself type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, on medication for both of those, psoriasis, um, allergies and asthma. I carried an inhaler from the time I was seven years old. Wow. <laughs> um, sleep apnea. I snored. I mean, all of that. And it was just, I'm at 42 and I'm like, I feel like I'm in my sixties. Like this is terrible. Um, and I just was exhausted and didn't like being on medication and I did not like being fat. And, um, so, you know, I credit keto with saving me. It definitely did. I personally feel better and less hungry, uh, when I'm, just strict carnivore. Um, I prefer the way I feel on that. Uh, so yeah, so all my health issues like reversed. I'm not on any medications. I lost over a hundred pounds. Um, I feel better. I definitely look, I definitely have cuter clothes, um, and great shoes, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been awesome and I'll never look back. Fantastic. Now, when I listen to your story, here's something that is very different. And one reason I had you here is because I can't, I can't really speak on the subject of eating disorders. Now mm -hmm. I have struggled with disordered thinking when mm -hmm. it comes to food and body image. I certainly did try to starve myself down at times. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was not bulimia and I wouldn't really even call it anorexia. It was just the only way I knew to lose weight was calories in, calories out. Yeah. And exercising. So I would push those limits. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you were hospitalized for several weeks. This is Yeah, in high school. Yeah, I I I just, you know, I discovered bulimia. I'm like, oh, here's a way I can eat and maybe I won't get fat. But I still put on weight when I was bulimic. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of, so speaking of the eating disorders, a yeah. lot of people think that eating disorders are either bulimia or anorexia. And then more recently, you know, over binge eating disorder. Okay. And, and that's, those are like, you know, the most common, 
um, you know, eating disorders. But basically, I mean, an eating disorder is any disordered behavior with food. And a lot of people have a bulimic mentality and behavior, even though they don't purge. Yeah. So like, for instance, um, you know, going on a binge and then, okay, now I'm going to fast for three days. That's bulimic mentality. Okay. Going on a binge and taking a bunch of laxatives is bulimic mentality. Going on a binge and, okay, now I'm going to exercise like a mad woman trying to burn off what I ate. That's bulimic mentality. So like there, it takes other forms, but all of that is disordered. Um, and we all have that voice of sabotage. You know, like we wake up in the morning with resolve. We're like, today is the day. You know, I'm going to get my crap together today, right? And then by noon or four o'clock, you know, we're, we hear this voice. And, you know, it's really been a hard day. You deserve a treat. Just go ahead and do it and start over tomorrow. And it's this like vicious cycle. It's like the voice of sabotage says all kinds of things like along those lines that it, it always ends with just start over tomorrow you know? <laughs> or Monday or get back to it on the first or, you know, ha Halloween rolls around and, and after Halloween, we're like, ah, you know, January 1st, we'll just get our crap together. Right. And it's just this vicious cycle. And you know what's going to make it easier to start the next day is if there's no junk food in the house. So I should probably just, I should probably just eat it now. And exactly. it won't be here tomorrow. That is actually, so I, I, te I teach a class, a food addiction and recovery group with one of our, with one of my friends, Jessica. And that is like one of the lies that we address. And this, it was a big one for me. It was like, oh, okay. Every night, like the voice of sabotage is like, if you eat it all tonight, there'll be none left tomorrow, which is total crap because I'm a grown woman. I own a car and a I have a driver's license. I can get in my car and go to the store and buy more. But like at the time you're just so desperate and you, you know, you're stuck in the cycle that you're like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. It like, does make it all tonight. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense in that moment. I have been there. It's, right. it's mental torture. It's a mental jail that we sometimes live in. Yeah. I have lived that. And so when you describe it that way, I kind of have had eating disorders. <laughs> I, I, it didn't come I think out. The majority of, of us do struggle with stuff like that. Yes. What, what causes that, do you think? Why do some of us? <laughs> the the $100,000 question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think basically it starts out like we discover that food makes us feel better. Like, you know, we use it for soothing, you know, like people, we always, you know, everybody describes it as I'm an emotional eater. Yeah. What that means is we use food to soothe ourselves. So like when people are lonely, well, let's eat, you know, let's eat or we're celebrating, let's eat. Or, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed. Let's eat. The kids are driving me crazy. Let's eat. You know I mean? Like we don't, we eat for like all these reasons except for I'm hungry. Like, right. We go on these diets and we're like, I'm so hungry. And we don't eat right until we like cave and binge. We have it like all, you know, backwards. We think food is our friend. We start using it for soothing. And then, you know, there's the biology side of it is once we start doing that, like our body can only take so much. And then eventually it becomes physical. You know, we become insulin resistant. We gain the weight. We feel hungry all the time. And then we're just like compelled to eat. And at that point it's physical and emotional. And a lot of the things we binge on have no real nutrient value. So we are no. actually, even though we're obese, or were we're, beast, yeah. we're malnourished. Yeah. And so exactly. you're all the time, literally you are hungry and you feel like you're starving. And we'd say, I remember I used to tell myself, how stupid is it that you feel like you're starving? You can stop eating and live off the fat of the land for two weeks. You're not starving. Right. I was starving in the fact that I was not properly nourished. Yeah. So I never felt satisfied. I was eating low fat junk all the time and it wasn't real food yeah i had so much like like the things that i believed were so crazy you know like i would eat an entire bag of swedish fish because it's fat free <laughs> or the whole box of like the little those remember the snack wells devils sugar free or i mean fat, sugar -free. Fat, -free. fat free yeah fat free cookies i'd eat the whole thing and it was like loaded with sugar like but you think you're like oh yeah no fat it's on my list of things we have in common. We absolutely both bought in completely 
to the I am fat, so I shouldn't eat fat. Yes. And so instead we replaced it with sugar and wondered why in the world we're still so fat. Yeah. I lived off of fat-free cereal and skim milk because it seemed so healthy and fat-free and just kept getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. And it just, it was, it was, it felt very helpless. I yeah. didn't know any way to fix it. For a very yeah. long time, it felt helpless. It was very frustrating. Do you remember spray butter? <laughs> Oh, I used to course. spray the heck out. I used to use the, I can't believe it's not butter spray butter on the toast. <laughs> like, yes. Yes, yeah. I do. I, that's what we were scared of was the butter. It yeah. was so backwards. All right. So you're, you're much more of an expert on the eating disordered side of it. What is it about carnivore? I've seen people come through our Facebook page and truly be freed or at least the most free they have ever felt mm -hmm. of eating disorders with a carnivore diet. Yeah. Why? What, what's at play? Well, it's a fantastic tool because it's the ultimate elimination diet. Mm -hmm. And it, so it removes everything that could possibly trigger you. Now, can people still emotionally eat meat? Yes, but it's probably not, it's not going to do the damage no. that emotionally eating a, you know, box of donuts is going to do, you know? Right. So it does. So the fact that it, you know, removes the trigger foods and that it's satiating and satisfying, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the great things about, about it is like, you know, you're not constantly suffering from hunger. You feel satisfied. And, you know, like when you first cut out carbs, you're going through like, like you're like, <gasps> you know, and you're like going through withdrawal and everything. But then when you, when ketosis hits, it's literally like this, like a physical relief. I can remember like five days in feeling physical relief and all of a sudden I wasn't like white knuckling it. It was like oh, this calmness. And that's how carnivore feels like all the time, just calm. I'm not jonesing for things. I'm not food fantasizing and going down the road of euphoric recall, recall because my brain is just calm. Um, I just think it, I mean, so it's a great tool if you're trying to recover from an eating disorder and, and this is what makes me crazy. Like, so because mainstream eating disorder treatment programs, they have a dismally high failure rate because they don't understand this. They'll call carnivore or keto or low carb restrictive, like being res like restrictive is a bad word. Yeah. We restrict ourselves from harmful things all the time. We don't go running across the freeway because we'll get smashed. We restrict ourselves from running across the free freeway. We restrict ourselves from putting our hand on the hot stove or in the fireplace because we know that's harmful. We restrict ourselves all the time and there's nothing disordered about res like restricting yourself from foods that are harmful, which it leads me to that next thing that they always say is, there are no bad foods. Um, yes, there are. There are a lot of bad foods for me. If it compels me to want to eat more, it causes me to lose control of my portions. It causes me to think about it all the time. It spikes my blood sugar and it makes me fat and gives me diabetes and all the other problems I had. Then it's a bad food. Preach it. Yes. <laughs> You're right. There are bad foods for me. That's right. I mean, obviously people get allergies. You know, some people are allergic to peanuts while other people love them and eat them by the back. But right. for me, you may not be able to say I'm allergic to carbs, but I could almost, I could almost say that with a clear conscience. It made me sick. Yeah. As much as some people would get sick from a peanut. I was miserable. I was infertile. I had boils. I was obese. I was sad. Right. I, yes, brain fog and sadness, just to yes. mm -hmm. that to me is as important as saying, oh, I get hives from eating a peanut. I'm allergic. I shouldn't mess with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I feel totally comfortable saying I'm allergic to carbs because I break out in fat pants. I break out in diabetes. I break out in high blood pressure. Like it, it causes the, these things. I have a, rea a bad reaction to eating carbs. Okay, I'm going to no longer feel any hesitancy at all. You heard it here. I'm flat out allergic to carbs, so don't bring them near me. In <laughs> fact, from now on, when I'm on an airplane, I'm going to need 
carb-free <laughs> zone, carb-free. That's right. <laughs> I don't even want to breathe carb air anymore. So my husband, like, this is a joke, you know, when you go out to eat, like you, you, you spe- you order what you want. Right. And you yes. tell them no sides. Yeah. But sometimes they'll like bring the sides and it's like on my plate and I'm like, seriously, like annoyed. And my husband is like, Oh, you did it now. She doesn't even want the carbs on her plate. <laughs> I don't want it touching my other food. <laughs> Yes. No, my husband knows too. Oh no, it's touched her burger. Yeah. <laughs> now I try to play it cool, but you're right. I don't want it touching my food. I don't. In the same way that somebody that's allergic to something else, they don't want it on their plate. Yeah. At all. Not because it's even a temptation. I literally no. just don't want it on my plate. Right. Like, no. <laughs> You know, they, they're like, I don't know why I binge. And we say things like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Why can't I just get my crap together? I, you know, I'm successful in other areas. Why can't I succeed with food? Why can't I lose weight? We like turn on ourselves and, and blame ourselves when the, when the fact of the matter is, is we have a disorder. And so that is what has to be addressed. Just listening to you talk, I'm having so many thoughts about why carnivore probably is really useful. So for one, it breaks the physical addiction because yeah. meat is not does not inspire that kind of addictions right. physically. It doesn't trigger things in the brain like sugar. Right. And so it doesn't cause us to lose control. Secondly, it is so nourishing that once you eat it, you can forget about food because right. you are literally full. So you can go on, just move on with life. Right. Third, I think that just knowing, just telling yourself, and I know this has helped me, you are not going to get fat eating just meat. You can kind of release yourself from that and be like, binge away. It's fine. It's just meat. You're not going to get fat eating it. It's kind of a, okay, well that helps, right? Ease a little bit of that fear. Cause I used to have so much fear about gaining weight, but I don't fear it at all eating meat. Okay, the fourth one I thought of was it is a really good way, eating only meat is a great way to tell if you're actually hungry. So I was never able to trust my hunger signals before. And I was all the time self-doubting, am I actually hungry or not? If you're not really hungry, a plate of meat does not taste good. That's right. It does not appeal. (laughs) <laughs> There's no appeal unless you're actually hungry. As yeah. soon as you're really hungry, meat tastes fantastic. I think it lets you feel in control and able to trust your own hunger signals, which I could see how in eating dis- disordered thinking would be really useful, right? Yeah. So you know if you're full, you know if you're hungry, you know you're not going to get fat eating this way. It takes away the physical addictions to these foods. Yeah. And then you're no longer just constantly craving for reasons that aren't true right. hunger. So now that I think about this with you, I can totally see why carnivore would be helpful for eating disorders. Now, That's some people will say, well, carnivore is an eating disorder. All right. Yeah. For people who say that, they have not lived our lives. They have not. I'm the freest, happiest I have ever been. I don't even feel restricted because I'm not really holding back from anything that I want. I eat what I want and I'm free from that. That's right. I'm no longer obsessed with food. It used to be my days revolved around food. I woke up thinking about food. I thought about food all day. I was always looking for recipes. I was like, what restaurant can I go to? I'm driving down the road. Oh, I need to hit that drive through I'm at the grocery store. Oh, look, candy bars, three for a dollar. Like all day long, my every waking hour was consumed by thoughts of food. And now I am free from that. And, and I do, I think it like people that you know, the people, the the eating disorder experts who, you know, they want to turn, uh, you know, even though we're, we've clearly demonstrated that we're incapable of moderating. This is what I was talking to Judy about. We're incapable of moderating. If I was a moderator, I never would have been a binge eater, never would have gotten fat. And, but they want to tell us, you know, oh, you know, you have to 
eat your fear foods. Don't, there's no bad foods. And you just have to learn how, you know, you could get food freedom and eat whatever you want. And it's such a lie. It's a lie. And it's so, you know, infuriating because there are obviously certain foods that compel me to want to eat more and meat is not one of them. It's very satisfying. I was like, okay, prime rib is my favorite. I usually only eat like one pound of prime rib, but could I eat two? <laughs> yes, because it's amazing. Uh, but I probably wouldn't need to eat for two days <laughs> if I ate two pounds of prime rib. It's just very satisfying and it removes that like compulsion. But where people run into problems is when they get in social situations and they they get that FOMO and they go down the road of food fantasy and euphoric recall and they see other people eating cake and stuff like that. It's the mental side that does them in because even though they're totally satisfied from meat, they haven't addressed their disordered behavior with the other foods. And so then, and we see, you probably see this happen in your group. We see it in our groups all the time. Oh, you know, it's my birthday and I had cake and now I'm struggling to get back to where I was. Yeah. Because you introduced it in the first place. If you never introduce it, you don't have the battle. No, I don't struggle with it anymore. And people who haven't gone a really long time of carnivore just can't really understand how much of a non-struggle it is. I, I literally, it's completely unappealing to me now. Like yeah. even the smell of it, I, yeah. it's I have a no desire. Right. Yeah. Mary, I promised you I'd keep you 30 minutes or less because I, I really do respect your time and I have so much respect for you. You are doing great things in this world and your light shines so bright. You're just a fun, delightful human. Well, and thank you so much. I was thrilled when, when you, you asked to talk to me. I'm like, oh, I love her. <laughs> I'm so glad because I love you too. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.